Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us um, today for the New Mexico Community Prosperity Virtual Summit. Um, the event is sponsored by USDA Office of Partnerships and Public Engagement and USDA Rural Development. Today's summit will feature presentations focusing on assisting disadvantaged farmers and ranchers, as well as our veteran farmers and ranchers. We will hear about a variety of programs and resources focused on USDA programs, water issues and rights, land acquisition and farm succession, and veteran farming. Just a few reminders before we get started. We'd like to ask all attendees to keep their microphones muted. Questions for our presenters may be submitted via the chat box. And due to time limitations, we may not be able to answer questions during the presentation, but we will make sure to follow up with answers to your questions after the presentation. A recording of this webinar and presentation will be sent to all attendees and will also be available on the summit website. And now I would like to invite Mr. Brian Zolko, National Outreach Coordinator for USDA Office of Partnerships and Public Engagement to give a few welcoming remarks. Thank you very much, Ruby. And I really appreciate some of the topics you've already discussed because you've cut down my speaking in half now. So I thank you very much. Uh, once again, as Ruby uh, mentioned, my name is Brian Zolko. I'm the National Outreach Coordinator for the Office of Partnerships and Public Engagement. Unfortunately, our boss, Director Mike Beatty, was unable to join us today, but he brings his warmest regards and best wishes from himself as well as Secretary Purdue. Before we really dive in, I wanted to give everybody uh, on this webinar an opportunity to understand a little bit more about the Office of Partnerships and Public Engagement. So I will highlight two or, excuse me, a few of our main divisions and some of the responsibilities associated with them. Um, the Office of Partnerships and Public Engagement was recently created in the new Farm Bill, and we have six main divisions. Uh, our first is the Office of Military Veterans. We have a youth office. We have a Minority Serving Institutions of Higher Education office, which primarily focuses on our Hispanic serving institutions, our 1890 land grant universities, as well as our 1994 tribal colleges. Uh, we uh, also have a socially disadvantaged farmer and rancher division, a faith-based and neighborhood partnerships division, and last but not least, a special initiatives uh, division, which some of the areas that they focus are women in agriculture, the White House initiative on Asian American and Pacific Islanders, the White House initiative on historically black colleges and universities, um, as well as farm worker coordination. I also am happy to uh, announce that there are several uh, New Mexico entities that were recently awarded a USDA 2501 grant, uh, the socially, socially Disadvantaged Farmers and Veterans and Ranchers grant. Um, so kudos to the Hispa Hispanic American Institute out of New Mexico, the New Mexico uh, Sequia Association, and last but not least, the Taos County Economic Development Corporation. So I do want to take a moment out real quick. There's many, many folks who are responsible for putting this summit on. So I want to take a brief opportunity to say thank you to the many members of the planning committee. In specific, specifically, we'd like to thank uh, Mr. Ernie Watson, Dr. Michael Patrick, Richard Lopez, Alicia Rodriguez, Leonard Luna, Eugene Pickett, Rudy Arendando, Lawrence Shorty, Lisa Yellow, Roberto Gonzalez Jr., Rachel Wellborn, Russ Gardner, and Catherine Spearing. Last but not least, I definitely want to give a major shout out to two individuals who definitely have spearheaded this effort for easily over the last six months, and that is uh, Mr. Terrence McDermott, Terry, and also Mrs. Uh, Ruby De La Garza. So uh, if you have an opportunity throughout the duration of the event to give a special thanks to each of those individuals because this would not be possible without them. Um, now I'm going to introduce our, um, our speaker, our, our main opener, uh, the current Secretary of Agriculture, Mr. Jeff Witte. Jeff grew up on his family's ranch on the Roe Mesa between Moore, Moore, Moore Ority and Las Vegas, New Mexico. He graduated from New Mexico State University with a bachelor's degree in agricultural business management 
and a master's degree in agricultural economics. Jeff was named New Mexico's fifth permanent secretary of agriculture in May of 2011. The bulk of Jeff's time as New Mexico's secretary of ag is spent on the road, meeting with groups that represent farmers and ranchers across the state. He also works to educate legislators about New Mexico agriculture. Jeff was appointed by the U.S. Department of Agriculture as a new member of the Advisory Council, Advisory Committee on Agricultural Statistics in 2020. The purpose of ACAS is to advise the U.S. Secretary of Agriculture and the National Agricultural Statistics Service on the conduct of agricultural censuses and surveys. ACAS members represent a variety of agricultural sectors across several U.S. states and districts, allowing for a broad representation of perspectives on various agricultural disciplines. He will serve as an ACAS, ACAS member through June of 2022. So without further ado, Secretary Witte, the floor is yours, sir. All right. Thank, thank you, Brian. And I also want to take a moment to thank Ruby and, and Terry for all the good work that they've done in putting this conference together. I, I, I can't think of a better time to do a conference like this than, than now. And with all the challenges that we've got and all the opportunities that I think are, are ahead of us. You, you know, COVID has proven one thing, and, and that's that the American consumer, the heck, the world consumer, still desires a good source of food. Uh, and and they're I think they have a, they have a, actually they have a better understanding about where their food is coming from. But so with that, you, you know, we have great opportunities here in New Mexico, and, and I think conferences like this really serve to showcase that opportunity. When you think of Mexico, we're the second oldest state in the nation when it comes to agricultural producers. Our producers average 60.5 years of age, and with that, we know we're going to have a, a, a tremendous transition in the, few, in the next coming years. Over the past several years, our department and, and several of our USDA agencies have partnered with some private industry partners to host the AgriFuture Conference. We had to postpone the conference last year because of COVID. Hopefully, we're going to get to do it in 2021. But I see on your agenda today, you've, you've got some of the transition issues covered and topics covered. And I think it's going to be critical that we're going to keep our production and agriculture going strong in New Mexico. There's so many opportunities out there and, and USDA has so many programs. I'm really pleased that you all are showcasing those opportunities to, to our producers and, and folks around the state of New Mexico and frankly across the country. Uh, you know, I, I've been in, at the Department of Agriculture for 26 years now. Uh, I came to the department in 1994. Back in those early days, the farm bill wasn't that big of a deal in New Mexico. In fact, at the Department of Agriculture, we dealt more with EPA and other agencies than we did with USDA. The USDA farm bill programs were mainly geared towards the Midwest, the corn, soybeans, and wheat. Oh my, how that has changed over the years. And, and now you've got conservation, a lot more conservation type programs. You've got the rural development programs. You've got all the insurance type programs. Uh, you've got the transition programs, you've got the, the programs serving uh, the, the veterans and, and minority uh, farmers across the nation. And, and we've seen a lot more opportunities for our, our producers to engage with USDA and, and, and really use those programs to grow their enterprises, grow the rural economies of the state, and, and really produce that food that people desire all across the world. Yesterday I spoke to the interim rural economic development committee for the state of New Mexico. And I, I showed one of my one of my graphs that I showed is that New Mexico products are actually exported to over 88 countries all across the world. And I think that's something that a lot of people don't, don't recognize and realize is that our products are desired across the world. But also more importantly here at home, our products are desired here by our own consumers. That's what partnerships take to, to make things happen for our citizens. And, and I'm really pleased with our partnerships with uh, all three of the entities here on the UAA call, FSA, Rural Development, and NRCS. Uh, we've got a tremendous team in, in New Mexico, and, and I really appreciate all the good things that you're doing. This conference is, is really going to help. I'm glad you're, you're recording. The, I hope you're recording this conference. I think you are. Uh, and it'll provide an, uh, a good 
source of information for those that even can't belong or can't join us today. So I want to thank you, Brian, for and and the team, Terry and Ruby, for inviting me to to open the conference today. I I can't thank you enough for doing this for the state of New Mexico. I, I know I was talking to Blake earlier. He's, he's going to be doing some some more broadband. We've got to increase our broadband capacity in the state of New Mexico. And thank goodness for the USDA programs to do that. That's just one of many. So I'm going to turn it back to, to Brian. And I wish you all a great conference and, and best of luck to everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary Woody. We, we definitely appreciate your time and attention. We hope to see you towards the end of this event as well, if your schedule permits. Um, now I will be jumping into uh, introducing and, and having greetings brought by our three state directors uh, of New Mexico at USDA. First and foremost, we have Mr. Blake Curtis, who is the state director of rural development. Good morning, Blake. Secondly, we have Mr. Michael White, the st State Executive Director of USDA Farm Service Agency. And last but not least, we have Mr. Xavier Montoya, who is the State Conservationist for the Natural Resources and Conservation Services. So without further ado, Mr. Curtis, we're going to kick it over to you to start with your greetings from uh, New Mexico, sir. Good morning, Brian, and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Jeff, for your kind comments and for your encouraging remarks. I've known Jeff a long time, and it's nice that people who are dedicated to agriculture continue to serve and to bring good things to our industry. I'm Blake Curtis. I'm the New Mexico State Director for USDA's Rural Development. I don't know how many of you know that I'm a fourth generation New Mexican. My great grandparents came here literally in a covered wagon. And my grandchildren are the sixth generation of Curtis's to call the plains of eastern New Mexico their home. It's a pretty remarkable thing to think of a covered wagon to broadband and the challenges of landing man on the moon that my grandparents saw to us dealing with an epidemic and a, and a pandemic like the uh, corona pandemic. I was just sharing yesterday with a friend of mine about these changes in agriculture and what I'd seen in my lifetime, all the way from a John Deere tractor with an umbrella to keep me cool, to GPS, auto steer, and a good book to occupy my time while I run from one end of the field to the other. And from open pollinated seeds to triple stack genes. In the world of livestock production, we use electronic ear tags to track livestock literally from their time of birth to the end of their life cycle. And I just heard yesterday from a friend of mine that there's newly developed facial recognition software that can be used to identify individual cattle. Now that's fascinating, isn't it? This world of virtual everything is um, almost beyond our ability to conceive, especially those of us who uh, think about where we started in this world. The virtual everything is a fascinating concept and it works for nearly every walk of life, but the production and the transportation, the delivery and quality protection of our food supply is a hands-on process. There are things that just can't be done virtually. USDA's rural development program as you're here today is involved in a number of ways in helping farmers and ranchers bridge the technology gap from the loan guarantees that Ray Melton will talk about here in a while, and the broadband programs that help connect our rural economies to their markets that Brian Smith will speak of, to the renewable energy assistance that's available through our REAP program. USDA RD is a source of support and encouragement to rural America. As you listen to all of our partners, and all that they have to offer in the way of assistance in becoming better stewards of our land and natural resources, be sure not to miss the message of rural development. Our piece of the production mission is really important. Rural development continues to fulfill that mission of providing better water and sanitation to rural communities along with the means to support both young and like me, more seasoned agriculturalists, in funding to pay for a more efficient and modern agricultural economy. It's my hope that today, 
you'll be filled with seeds of information that you'll find useful and encouraging. Share the information that you hear about today with your friends and with your neighbors because every good agriculturalist knows that to share is to sow. And we should all be kind enough to sow generously. Thanks. Have a great day. Hope you enjoy today's summit. And thanks to the organizers. Thank you very much, Mr. Curtis. Great introduction, great overview. We really appreciate your comments. Uh, next, we're going to have Mr. Michael White bring greetings from Farm Service Agency. Mr. White. Good morning. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate the, the intro. And I would like to take the time to thank all of the people that helped put this program together. I took quite a few of them, but a couple of them, Ruby and Terry, have done a great job. And thank them for all that they've done. Uh, Farm Service Agency is, is a program that has two basic programs that we use in our portfolio to help farmers and ranchers. We have farm programs, which entails the safety net programs, conservation reserve programs. We have aerial photography available and a large record of those that can be utilized by farmers and ranchers and market, market programs. And also we have farm loans, which we use direct and guaranteed loans and operating and farm ownership loans. And basically, if I say safety net conservation programs help sustain and preserve lands for future generations, which is a big thing going forward. You know, we've got in 2050, the world population is going to be over 9 billion. And we're going to need to double the food supply the way they figure it in order to serve those. And with that, we're going to need a lot of young farmers in our programs and in agriculture. And FSA has beginning farmer programs and veteran programs and uh, socially disadvantaged programs in order to help new and young people get into the to the business of agriculture. We just started a program in five pilot states across the nation and New Mexico is one of those for urban ag programs. So we started pilot projects in order to to help and figure out and find out what is needed in the urban ag areas to help them propagate and begin farming and help them with different programs that might help them get started and to keep running. And so today we'll have Joy Lynn Gray and she'll be presenting on farm programs, more detailed stuff, and Leanne Gibbs and the farm programs farm loans. In the farm loans, we try to uh, help beginning farmers and existing farmers start up and equip their operations and uh, for existing producers to expand or stay in business. Our safety net programs are really geared to help people in hard times. We have disaster programs that when things don't go right, which all of us in agriculture know they normally don't go right. So we're there to, to help and to give them a hand up. We can't make people whole, but we can try to help them stay in business and keep moving and, and exist. We have CFAP program, the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program that we started this year, CFAP 1 and CFAP 2. And as everybody knows, this virtual world we're in now, things are a lot different. So markets are a lot different. And so the CFAP program was set up to help people get through these times, to help them with their market assistance. Uh, like Blake was saying, it's a virtual world out there anymore. And these meetings are, they're okay virtually, because we get to see each other in some form or fashion. but. You know, all of us would really like to be in one place and and get to greet and meet everybody. But uh, I guess we have to do it the way that we have to do it. And I hope everybody has a great conference and that you learn a lot and share, like Blake said. And so I wish you a good conference and we'll talk to you later. So thank you, Brian. Mr. White, thank you very, very much. And I just wanted to segue for one moment. You brought up a very 
important component that I did not touch upon earlier in my introduction, uh, specifically the CFAP program. I did want to say in a line with kind of Mr. White's sentiments is we're all facing a drastically different normal, especially the last six to eight months. I would be remiss if I didn't say USDA has led the charge in the field, specifically with the Farmers to Families Food Box program, when it comes to making that extra, taking that extra effort to meet folks where they're at. So I, I definitely want to say as much as we are trying to adjust, I have to give incredible kudos to USDA and nonprofits and intermediaries across the entire country who have come together under this most tumultuous time to get food to, to families who really need it. So I, I was on a, a conference call yesterday and we've, USDA has nearly distributed 150 million meals across the country. So I think that's something every one of us should be very proud of. Uh, thank you very much for the comments, Mr. Uh, White. I look forward to learning a little bit more about what FSA has to offer across the board. And now I'm gonna kick it to uh, Mr. Montoya, who is our state conservationist in New Mexico. Good morning, Mr. Montoya. Good morning, Brian, and thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Uh, wanted to definitely have a, give a shout out to Jeff Witte uh, as Secretary of Ag for New Mexico. He's always a great leader for all of us, kind of make sure that we're all heading in the right direction uh, and always looks out for New Mexico. Uh, so truly appreciate it, Jeff. Uh, but he did make some comments that, that I thought were so apropos to right now, and that's the fact that USDA almost used to be non-existent in New Mexico. And when you talk about the Farm Bill and how it's changed and where we sit now and all the different programs that we have to offer, let me just say that we have come kind of full circle in the Farm Bill. And so here we sit now with so many opportunities and many targeted opportunities within the Farm Bill. And when you have words like acequia, and land grant that end up in the farm bill dealing with our programs, that's huge. That shows that New Mexico is on the map, that New Mexico is now uh, looked at nationally. And so when Jeff talks about all the food that shipped out of New Mexico, that just shows where New Mexico sits in ag. Uh, before I get into some other comments, I did want to send a little shout out to, to the folks that set up this meeting. Uh, because when you get a group as diverse uh, as, as you had, and let me just say, when you get a group with Rudy Arredondo and Eugene Pickett uh, in that, you're gonna have a good meeting. You're gonna have a lot of ideas as to what is it that people wanna hear and want to talk about to make sure that we're moving in the right direction. So well done group. Uh, I know uh, Luke Luna and uh, Alicia Rodriguez from NRCS were on that planning committee, so I do wanna thank them as well. Uh, but for NRCS, Christine Graham Chavez is gonna talk about our programs a little later on. Uh, let me say we are not as diverse as rural development. I mean, they could build a city for you all. Uh, what, what a great group of programs that they have. Farm Service Agency, definitely uh, able to keep farmers, farmers, ranchers, ranching, everything that they have from safety nets to loans, uh, they have so much to offer. But for NRCS, I, I don't want to, to say that we don't have anything, but we are very, conservation focus. We are on the ground. We are there to help ranchers and farmers on the ground with their place, looking at their resources. And so that's where NRCS comes from. That's what Chris Graham Chavez is going to talk about, to make sure that you all understand everything, the breadth of programs that we have for New Mexico. And let me just tell you before uh, she gets into her stuff and we move on, I always feel bad because for New Mexico, we usually have about 1,500 applications come in for our programs and we only fund about a third of them. So only 500 contracts out of all that. And don't get me wrong, we're always asking for more money. We wanna bring those dollars to New Mexico, but do not be dissuaded from applying just because of those numbers. We wanna make sure people are coming in the door because we know there's a bigger need than the dollars that we have, but we have to continue to demonstrate that. And I would say that probably goes for FSA and rural development as well. There's always a need and as state conservationists, and I'm sure as the state directors, they want to go get more dollars from the department, bring it to New Mexico for the folks here in New Mexico. So Brian, thank you so much. I look forward to, to sitting in, to learning a lot of what's going on with you all and what's going on with the different programs. Uh, so Brian, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Montoya. Um, 
once again, let us just stop and pause and, and give thanks to the incredible three leaders that we have here today. Um, it's unequivocal that New Mexico is definitely in good hands here. And uh, we really appreciate the continuation of these partnerships between uh, field-based agencies and OPPE. So once again, thank you, Blake. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Xavier. Um, we're really looking forward to a great virtual summit. I can't wait to learn a lot more. We have water issues and rights up on deck. And I am now gonna pass it over to the master of ceremonies, Miss Ruby De La Garza. Ruby, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Brian. And um, thank you to all our state directors for their welcome and greetings. Um, now we will begin with our first presentation focused on USDA programs. And before they begin, I just wanna briefly introduce our panel of speakers. Representing USDA Rural Development are Ray Melton, the Program Director for Business and Cooperative Programs, and Brian Smith, Telecom General Field Representative. Representing USDA Farm Service Agency are Leanne Gibbs, Farm Loan Chief, and Joy Lynn Gray, Farm Program Chief. And last but not least, representing USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service is Christine Graham Chavez, Assistant State Conservationist for Field Development. So without further ado, Mr. Ray Melton with Rural Development. Good morning and thank you, Ruby. My name is Ray Melton. I'm the Business and Cooperative Program Director for New Mexico. And what I'd like to present to you today is three of our main programs that we offer. It's not all of the programs, but it is a good broad range of programs that provide quality assistance to people in New Mexico. Um, up first, we have our Rural Energy for America Guaranteed Loan and Grant Program. Following that, we have our Business and Industry Guaranteed Loan Program, our BNI Program, and then uh, a brief summary of the BNI CARES Act. And then following that, we have our Value Added Producer Grant. Next slide, please. As of October 1, 2020, Rural Development consolidated and standardized the rules regarding the making and servicing of four guaranteed loan programs. The four guaranteed loan programs are community facilities, water and waste disposal, business and industry, and the Rural Energy for America program. Next slide, please. Reef loan guarantees are utilized by lenders to mitigate risk, increase capital use, and to assist lenders in meeting the Community Reinvestment Act. Next slide, please. Here are the eligible projects. We do uh, the purchase of renewable energy systems, and we do energy efficiency improvements. The eligible borrowers or grantees are agricultural producers or rural small businesses. Next slide, please. On the guaranteed loan, we do uh, up to 80% of a guarantee. And we start out at least a minimum of 5,000, not to exceed 75% of eligible project cost. The maximum loan amount is 25 million. Below we have our fees listed, uh, typically 1% guarantee fee with a half a percent annual renewal fee on the outstanding principal balance. And the term is determined based uh, with the lender in conjunction with the agency. And that's how we establish the loan terms. And we do not do any balloon payments on those loans. Next slide, please. Uh, grants are available as a standalone project. So if you come into the program, you can do a grant or you can do a grant loan combination. Uh, the grants are for 25% of the total project cost. And if we do a grant in conjunction with a loan, we can do an additional 50% with a loan guarantee for 75% of the total project. If we just come in and do the loan guarantee, we can do the full 75%. Uh, the grant is reimbursement only and the project must be completed and fully funded and show 30 days of operation on a renewable energy system for the reimbursement to occur. Next slide, please. Uh, we have energy efficiency grants, and we start out with a $1,500 minimum, go up to a $250,000 maximum. And then on renewable energy systems, we have a $2,500 minimum and go up to a $500,000 maximum in the size of the grants. Next slide, please. 
Okay, now we're moving on to the BNI guaranteed loan. Uh, so what is a BNI? Uh, it's a federal guarantee of a loan made by a lender. The lender applies to rural development for the guarantee. There's two steps to the guarantee process. The USDA issues a lender a conditional commitment before the loan closing. And then the USDA issues a loan note guarantee after the loan is closed. And this is for the finance of good quality businesses that create or save good quality jobs in rural New Mexico. Next slide, please. Eligible areas, uh, area of 50,000 in population or less, not adjacent to an urbanized area, and it's based on the 2010 census right now. Uh, the headquarters may be based in a large city, but the project must be located in a eligible rural area. The lender may be located anywhere. Almost all of New Mexico's communities qualify. And then you have a website, there's a, an eligibility map that you can go check and that link will take you to that eligibility map and you can type in your address and see if you're eligible. Uh, we also do local food projects in urban areas. Next slide, please. Uh, eligible borrowers are for-profit businesses, nonprofits, cooperatives, federally recognized tribes, public bodies, and individuals. Next slide. Eligible purposes. We can do real estate in buildings. Uh, they can be non-owner occupied. Uh, they can be mixed use properties, um, provided that the building's projected revenue generated from the business is greater than 50%. Uh, equipment, furniture, fixtures, working capital. And this can include ESOP, and ESOP stock. Um, we take out of interim financing, complete application or application prior to closing interim loan. We do refinances. Uh, there are some restrictions to the refinances that you'll have to work through with the lender. And then we also do new market tax credit structures. Next slide, please. Okay, the guarantee. We do a 80% guarantee on any loan amount. The maximum loan amount is 25 million. Our fees are 3% upfront on the guaranteed loan. We do a half a percent annual renewal fee that's established on the outstanding principal balance on 1231 of each year. Uh, if we also do another half a percent fee if the uh, lender requests a loan note guarantee upfront for the construction of a facility. Uh, the term is again negotiated between the agency and the lender and the borrower and we concur with that term. And then we do not do balloon payments. Next slide, please. Purpose, the loan is for working capital to support business operations. Uh, we have some general requirements. Uh, business must have been in operation uh, since uh, 215 of 2020. Uh, and this is on our CARES Act. Uh, working capital includes, but is not limited to wages, rent, supplies, insurance, utilities, telephone, and in interest. Uh, we also look at working capital for agricultural operation is eligible when the loan request exceeds Farm Service Agency's guaranteed loan authority, and that's 1.77 million. Maximum term is for 10 years. Interest rate is negotiated between the lender and the borrower. And then we have a 90% guarantee on any loan amount. And the fees are 2% uh, on the guaranteed portion. And then we again do the half a percent annual renewal fee. Next slide, please. Okay, now we are moving over to our value added producer grant. Uh, this grant provides funds for economic planning activities or eligible working capital expenses to enable viable agricultural products to develop a business that produce and market value added agricultural products and to create marketing opportunities for such businesses. Next slide, please. Uh, we do not have our funding established for the 2021 year. Our maximum award for a planning grant is 75,000. For working capital, it's 250,000. This is a one-to-one -one match or a 50% of the total project cost. Next slide, please. Uh, application types, we have independent producers, 
agricultural producer groups, farmer and rancher cooperatives, majority control producer based businesses, and you can see the definitions of all of those that are in there. Next slide, please. Uh, there's two types of grants. We have a planning grant and we have a working capital grant. And uh, majority of the projects that we do are working capital grants. Uh, that goes in to actually help you pay eligible project costs and expenses related to the processing and or marketing of the value added product. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the types of value added producer grants that you can have. Uh, number one, you take the product and you have a change in physical state or it is in, produced in a manner that enhances the value of the agricultural commodity. You have physical seg segregation. Uh, it's a farmer based, renewable, farmer ranch based renewable energy, or it's a locally produced agricultural fruit product. Next slide, please. Uh, here is probably the most important slide, our contact information. Uh, on the top left is my contact information and I will assist you with all the programs that need assistance. Uh, I have a BNI coordinator, Ms. Patricia Navaretti, and her contact information is top right. Bottom left is for the renewable energy programs and energy efficiency programs, Mr. Carlos Contreras. And the bottom right is for the value added producer grant, Ms. Kathy Barrett. Next slide, please. And that concludes my presentation. I would now like to turn it over to Mr. Brian Smith. He is the Telecom General Field Representative for Rural Development. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Smith. I'm the General Field Representative for Telecom in Arizona and New Mexico. Uh, Ruby, if you could go ahead and move that slide forward. Um, the first, I'm gonna cover a few programs and I'm gonna move really quickly here um, since we do have limited time. And I'm just gonna kinda go through these programs and you know, you're always free to contact me for additional information. Uh, the first program I'm gonna go over is the distance and learning and telemedicine program. Uh, Ruby, please, the next. Um, this program basically is used to improve distance learning or telemedicine in rural America. And what it does is it funds equipment that brings in the opportunity to offer services that are offered in an urban area. So real-time communication with doctors or real-time communications with the teacher that might be in a um, urban area and maybe the school can't offer a certain class, um, such as dual enrollment credits. Next slide, please. Um, this program is, is a competitive program, so it's scored. Uh, there are four scoring categories. Three of those are objective and one is subjective. So we use census numbers to score rurality. Um, we use uh, SAPE scores to uh, score economic need. And then we usually have a section for special considerations. Um, in the past, that has been uh, opportunity zones, school, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, opioid use disorder uh, or treatment plans that are used for, uh, you get extra points for that, and then STEM learning. And then you also have a subjective section, which is your uh, need and benefits. And that, that allows us to maybe take into consideration some things that are not um, brought about in either the rurality or economic need. Next, uh, next slide, please. Um, basically, there's certain eligible purposes and there's ineligible purposes. Some of the things, these are things we commonly see people uh, sometimes think that they can get covered in this grant that it does not cover. Um, paying for medical or educational equipment that doesn't have the predominant purpose, 50%, uh, greater than 50% um, for telemedicine or distance learning. Um, electronic medical records, we won't cover that. Uh, medical equipment that isn't always used. Um, for example, we've had people try and maybe get like a, a MRI machine or something because they send off the uh, imaging to a radiologist and that does not work, it's not real time. Um, or purchase of land or application costs. Next slide, please. Here's some of the things that we do cover. Um, computer hardware and software, audio and video equipment, uh, network components to make the system work, telecommunications equipment, uh, data, data terminal equipment, uh, inside wiring, uh, audio and video equipment, of course, is a big portion of this. 
And then broadband facilities can uh, be covered as long as they're owned by the applicant. So, you know, say you have a connection that you need to get to down the street. If you were to use a portion of the grant funds for that, that is a possibility to use a grant with some conditions. Next slide, please. Um, in this grant, you are required to do a matching contribution. Uh, it's 15% of the grant amount um, requested. Uh, there is some provisions for not doing that, but that does not apply to New Mexico. New Me uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is the website. Um, if you just Google actually distance learning, uh, rural development, you'll come up with the website as well. Next slide, please. Uh, the Community Oriented Connectivity Broadband Grant Program, or as we call it, Community Connect, is the next one I wanted to talk to you about. Next slide, please. Um, this program basically is a program to create broadband service in an area that doesn't have terrestrial based service. And um, this year they made a change to this program where it used to incorporate cell service as um, terrestrial based. And they finally were able to remove that thanks to some language in the last farm bill. And so now cell service or LTE does not count against um, the data requirements which in the current round, which is open right now, is 10-1. Uh, and when the project is complete, you would have to have a uh, service of 25-3. Uh, the minimum amount is $100,000 for the grant, and the maximum amount is $3 million. Next slide, please. Uh, these are some of the eligible applicants for this program. It pretty much covers everyone except individuals and partnerships. Um, as long as you have the legal capacity and you're going to be willing to run a um, internet service provider company, then you could be eligible for this program. Next slide, please. Um, basically, here's some of the keys to the program to be eligible for a Community Connect grant. Um, it has to serve a proposed funded service area where 10-1 service does not exist. Um, you draw that service area, so um, it has, just has to be contiguous, but that would be your mapping that you draw, so you do need to just make sure that it doesn't have that 10-1 service in the area. Uh, when you're done, you got to uh, serve it at 25-3. You have to offer, as part of the agreement, you have to offer free service at the broadband grant speed, that 25-3 or higher, to any critical community facilities located within uh, the, the service area that you drew for at least two years, and that would be public schools or education center, library, hospitals, uh, police, ambulance, those types of things. Um, you also must provide a community center with at least two computer access points and wireless access at the broadband grant speed free of all charges for users at least two years, and so that it can be open to residents um, in the area so they could take advantage of part of that um, new service. Next slide, please. Um, Brian, you have one minute. Okay, well, I'll get right. Let's just uh, go on to the next one really quick <laughs> to the reconnect. All right, so reconnect is another program we have. This program is largely funded right now. It's not open again until the fall, but this program um, offers grants um, at 100% funding from the USDA, 25% for you. And it also has loans at 2% interest rate, and then it has a 50% loan, 50% grant component. And this program um, can change as it comes out. The last round is 25 for the speed required when you're done. Service uh, unserved area was 10-1. Um, tomorrow, we're gonna have some uh, New Mexico awards announced. I believe there are four of them. In the last round, we had three of them. So New Mexico is benefiting from this program. And if you have any questions um, on these programs, you can contact me <clears throat> at brian.smith1 at usda.gov. It's brian.smith1 at usda.gov. That's my info. And um, I'd love to talk to any of you more about this, these programs. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Leanne Gibbs with Farm Service Agency. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for attending 
uh, this virtual summit. Um, I'm excited to be here. And I just want to share uh, a little bit of information about Farm Service Agencies uh, one of the arms of Farm Service Agency, our farm loan programs. Um, I am the farm loan chief uh, for the state of New Mexico. Uh, next slide, please. And I, I administer the, the farm loan programs for the state of New Mexico for Farm Service Agency. Our objective of our programs is to provide uh, supervised credit and management assistance to eligible farmers and ranchers um, to become owners or operators or both of family farms. And also, as we've seen kind of uh, in the pandemic uh, with all of our natural disaster droughts, we're here to try to also help those operations continue um, when they don't have credit available elsewhere or to help them return to normal farming operations after sustaining substantial losses as a result of a designated or declared disaster. Our regulations do apply to loan applicants, borrowers, lenders, holders, agency personnel, and other parties involved in making, guaranteeing, holding, servicing, or liquidating such loans. Our programs are actually designed, our loan programs are designed to allow those who participate to transition to private commercial credit or other sources of credit in the shortest period of time practicable through the use of our supervised credit. Um, which some of that includes uh, our loan officers assisting our borrowers with uh, doing farm assessments. Uh, we offer borrower training in both financial management and production management and uh, market placement, uh, which helps with borrower graduation. Next, please. Supervised credit, this is something that FSA does a little differently than um, your normal commercial lenders, uh, the banks that we have here in New Mexico. Uh, we assist family farmers with, like I said, with temporary financial supervisory assistance to improve their potential to graduate to credit from commercial lenders. Um, what we want is basically to get uh, beginning farmers into our program so that they can get started because we do realize that it's very difficult for those that are just wanting to start up their farming or ranching operations and um, to have maybe the cash that they need for down payments um, or equity position available in assets for commercial lenders to consider uh, making loans to them. So that is what our programs are here for. Um, we do have uh, some program objectives uh, that are in place, uh, such as term limits. We have graduation requirements. And we also offer market placement to assist eligible borrowers to obtain guaranteed loans. Next, please. In order to be a part of our direct loan programs, we do require uh, borrower training. Uh, we do com require completion of farm assessments. Um, and we do ask that the applicants or borrowers do have input in on the farm assessments. Uh, the agency is gonna complete a year end analysis with our borrower to see how did we do whenever we came up with our farm operating plan at the beginning of the year, which we all know is a guesstimate. But then we like to, at the end of the year, see how good we got, uh, how close we got there. Uh, as part of our supervised credit, uh, it is FSS role to help direct loan borrowers or applicants. Uh, we identify short, intermediate, and long-term goals. Uh, we try to pinpoint and prioritize some problem areas that we might see. Our loan officers are uh, very good at uh, kind of assessing the different types of operations that we have around the state. And if we don't know uh, answer to a question, we definitely have contacts that we can put our borrowers or applicants in touch with, or we can call ourselves to try to get answers to all of those questions. Like I said, that is part of our supervised credit that we do offer. Uh, we also 
uh, we'll try to help in developing strategies and an operational plan to meet the operations goals. Uh, we also try to provide some objective credit counseling if we can um, to try to help our, our younger and beginning uh, borrowers uh, to try to start down that long road of, of becoming a viable operator here in the state of New Mexico. And we like to evaluate the progress and adjust the action plan as needed as we go along. Next, please. The applicant and borrower also has a role in our supervised credit because it's their operation. So they need to, to be uh, responsible for the success of their farming and ranching operation. We just serve as in an advisory role. And so the applicant and borrower should be prepared uh, to graduate to commercial credit by, uh, we want them to identify goals, like I said, short-term, intermediate, and long-term. Uh, we also want them to, to start pinpointing and prioritizing problem areas as they see as they go along. Um, develop some strategies. Uh, we want them evaluating the progress and adjusting their action plan. And they need to also comply with borrower responsibilities that are set out in their uh, borrower responsibility that is signed uh, once the loan is approved. Next, please. As Mr. White talked about earlier, we do have under farm loans, we have two different types of loan programs. We have our direct loan programs um, and our guaranteed loan programs. When we talk about direct loan programs, this is our program that is designed um, to help farmers or ranchers start, purchase, expand their farming operation. Um, we go anywhere from beginning farmers who have very limited financial history uh, to qualify for commercial credit to farmers who have suffered financial setbacks um, from natural disaster. And we also offer a variety of loans that provide additional resources uh, that farmers may need to establish and maintain profitable farming operations. On our direct loan programs, uh, farmers and ranchers apply for direct loans at their local FSA offices. Next, please. Um, and through our direct loan programs, uh, the, the local FSA office that you have there in your area. We have four uh, regional service uh, centers, farm loan service centers here in the state of New Mexico. There is actually one located in each quarter uh, of, of New Mexico. So we have four and those are the offices that actually process and service the direct loan applications. Uh, like I said, we provide more, uh, we do more at FSA than just provide credit. We work with our farmers and ranchers strengths and opportunities for improvement, production and management. We also try to help uh, our borrowers find alternative options so that you can see, uh, achieve success. Learning and improving business planning and financial insight through our FSA's credit management is the difference between success and failure for many farm families. Next, please. For our uh, direct and guarantee loans, we do have uh, eligibility requirements that have been established uh, by uh, Congress, who actually has written all of the regulations for our programs. Um, I won't go through each of these, but as you can see, uh, there are quite a few eligibility uh, requirements that have to be met in order to be eligible. Some of the big ones are, is that you have to have a satisfactory credit history. Um, you need to not be able, uh, be unable to obtain credit elsewhere at reasonable rates and terms to meet your actual needs. And uh, you can't have had any uh, losses of debt forgiveness with FSA. This is just a quick little uh, fact sheet that is available on the website, uh, www.fsa.usda.gov, where you can pull up, and these are the different types of loan programs, direct loan programs that we offer. Uh, as you can see, 
uh, our direct farm ownership loan, our maximum loan amount is $600,000. This changed with the 2018 Farm Bill to increase it up to 600,000. Our direct operating loan, uh, maximum farm, um, farm operating loan is 400,000. Next, please. Um, like I said, we have our guaranteed loan programs. Those are actually loans that go through uh, banks and we basically underwrite those loan programs. If you want to go kind of to the end, Ruby, um, I'll just kind of share some information just real quick with the uh, economic impacts of our loan programs. It's like about slide number 19. Okay, here we go. This looks good right here. Um, over the last five years, of course, we've had significant financial impacts here in, in New Mexico. Um, our investments have averaged about $25 million through our direct loan program and about not quite $27 million through our guaranteed loan program. So over a five-year average uh, here in New Mexico, FSA farm loan programs have put in about 51, a uh, little short of $52 million. And these are taxpayer dollars that we're investing in New Mexico. Next, please. Uh, this just kind of shows you the growth of how we've grown through our, our programs and loans that we've obligated over the years. Next, please. Uh, like I said, we've grown here in New Mexico. We've had over 100% growth in our direct loan portfolio. Uh, we started out in FY 2011 at 400. We're now up to 831 direct loan borrowers. And we've had a growth also in our direct loan borrowers. Next, please. Uh, just another overview of where we are with uh, socially disadvantaged applicants and beginning farmers. As you can see, that's where the majority of our loan obligations do go. Next, please. Uh, you can go ahead and go to the next one. These are is our contact information for our four uh, regional service centers throughout the state. We have one in Clovis, Roswell, Las Cruces, and Estancia, and then the state office contact. That is myself and my farm lung specialist. Thank you. And I now, now I'll pass it over to our farm program chief, Joy Lynn Gray. Good morning. Uh, my name is Joy Lynn Gray. I'm the farm loan chief uh, for, or I'm sorry, farm program chief for um, FSA. Next slide, please. Um, Farm Service Agency, also known as FSA, is part of USDA Department of Agriculture. Um, we administer programs that provide a safety net for farmers and ranchers. Next, please. The agency is a customer-driven agency um, with a diverse, multi-talented workforce who's dedicated to achieving an economically and environmentally sound future for American agriculture. The mission is to equitably serve all farmers and ranchers and agriculture partners through the delivery of effective, efficient agriculture programs. Next, please. The foundation of FSA's mission and vision rests upon um, USDA's core values of strong ethics, customer service, teamwork, inclusive decision-making, and fiscal responsibility. Next slide, please. FSA offers a variety of programs ranging from commodity programs to uh, price support programs to disaster programs. Um, those listed on the slide, I'll touch on a couple of them. We have an ELAP program, which is an emergency assistance for livestock, honeybees, and farm-raised uh, fish program, and that provides emergency assistance to eligible producers of livestock, honeybees, and farm-raised fish. We have the marketing assistance loans that provides uh, producers interim financing at harvest time to meet cash flow needs without having to sell their commodities when the uh, market prices are typically at a harvest time low. We have the LIP program, which is a livestock indemnity program. That program benefits uh, for livestock deaths or reduced sale prices um, due to injury caused by an eligible cause of loss, um, which includes adverse weather um, or eligible diseases. NAP is a big one in New Mexico. That's a non non-insured crop assistance program and that provides assistance to producers of non-insurable crops with low yields, loss of inventory, or preventive planning due to natural disasters. 
And then we have the Livestock Forward Program, which offers payments to eligible livestock producers with eligible livestock that suffered grazing losses due to drought during the normal grazing season. And then we also have the Corona Food Assistance Program, also known as CFAP, and that program is, um, provides producers with financial assistance that gives them the ability to absorb some of the increased marketing costs associated with COVID. Next slide, please. Um, another arena we have are conservation programs. The big one is conservation reserve programs. Under that, we have a general program where the contracts are typically between 10 and 15 years. Producers get the land back to almost its native state and um, they get annual payments. Um, we have a grasslands program, which is a working land program where producers are still um, getting their land back to a certain cover, but they're able to graze the land under certain conditions according to what the plan is. We have SAFE, that program prioritizes wildlife. And then we have TIP, which um, allows beginning farmers, ranchers to um, take over a conservation contract once it's in its last years um, from the original owner. And then we also have the emergency conservation program where we don't like to have it only because that means there was a disaster, but that program does provide emergency funding and technical assistance to rehabilitate um, farmland that's been damaged by natural disasters. Next slide, please. Um, just kind of giving some definitions. A socially disadvantaged producer is defined as a farmer or rancher who's a member of a socially disadvantaged group whose members have been subjected to racial or ethnic prejudice because of their identity as members of a group um, without regard to their individual qualities. Gender is not included in this group. Next slide, please. Those groups include American Indians, Alaskan Natives, Asians, Asian Americans, Black or Black or uh, African um, Americans, Native Hawaiians or Pacific Islanders and Hispanics. Next slide, please. A limited producer is defined as a producer um, where both of the conditions apply, where a producer whose direct or indirect gross um, farm sales do not exceed 100,000 in both of the two calendar years that precede the calendar year that correspond to the relevant program year. Next slide. The second criteria is a producer um, whose total household income is at or below a national poverty level for a family of four or less than 50% of the county median household income for the same calendar years as I referenced in the previous slide. Next slide, please. Um, beginning farmers or ranchers, and this also includes uh, veteran farmers or ranchers, a person or legal entity for who um, in a program year has never um, previously operated a farm or ranch or has not operated a farm or ranch in the previous 10 years, and this applies to all members if it's an entity, um, will have or has had for a relevant period materially and substantially participated in the operation of a farm or ranch. Um, just a, a quick note, I, the uh, veteran farmer or rancher um, will be um, considered that um, the, a person who has not operated a farm or ranch for more than 10 years total or has obtained a status of as a veteran during the most recent 10 period or 10 year period. Next slide, please. Um, if it's a legal entity if, or if a legal entity requests to be considered so, socially disadvantaged, limited resource or beginning farmer, um, at least 50% of the, of the persons in the entity must um, in their individual capacity meet the definition as I just explained. Um, it must be clearly demonstrated that the entity was not formed for the purposes of avoiding the purchase requirement or formed after the deadline of a purchase requirement. Next slide, please. FSA has a variety of tools for producers um, that they can obtain online. The first one is farmers.gov. This site, it enables farmers to track the status of their eligible employer application. It streamlines the login information if a producer has um, an existing account, they can, they can uh, work on uh, multiple applications. Next slide, please. Um, it enables easy access to the Department of Labor um, gateway. It allows farmers to track uh, time sensitive actions in the course of um, the Office of Foreign Labor uh, Certifications, adjudication of temporary labor certifications, and it allows farmers to access all application forms online. Next slide, please. 
Um, FSA also offers gov delivery alerts and what this is is our communication platform that um, producers are allowed to subscribe to and they'll receive emails about our programs or services. This is in essence taking the place of the paper newsletters that the county offices used to send out monthly. If you want to sign up for eGov, you can either call your local FSA office or you can click on the link that's shown on the slide and sign up there. Next slide, please. The um, next method of obtaining information is our text message alerts, and these allow you to get um, timely information about program deadlines, acreage reporting dates, kind of quick information um, media that allows you to know what's going on. If a producer wants to sign up for text message alerts, they dial um, 372669. Uh, and in that message or in the body of the message, you type in the, the state's abbreviation, in this case, New Mexico, and then the county um, of where, where you want to get the information uh, for. So if you want to just do one county, it'd be NM Valencia. If you want to do multiple counties, just make sure they're on each line. Um, next slide, please. FSA has a variety of ways to keep in touch. You can use Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and our websites. Um, FSA's website is www.fsa.usda.gov. Um, Farmers.gov is www.farmers.gov. Um, you can access any information you need for um, USDA Farm Service Agency on those sites. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, any questions that there may be, go ahead and enter them in the chat box and we can um, answer them. And then this slide shows you um, my information as well as the staff members, Anthony Chavez. He is our prog uh, program specialist who covers disaster programs. And then Amanda Wright, she is the program specialist that covers um, the safety net and the price support programs. And I cover um, the conservation programs. And I do thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, our next speaker um, is Chris Graham Chavez with Natural Resources Conservation Service. Good morning, everyone. I greatly appreciate uh, the invite to speak today. I'm going to go over real quick. Um, next slide, please. The origins of NRCS, we started off as the Soil Conservation Service during the Dust Bowl uh, days of the 1930s. And so uh, we had a next slide, please. Hugh Hammond Bennett, who was our um, chief, first chief of the Soil Conservation Service. In uh, 1994, we became the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Next slide. Um, what we do is we operate uh, through the farm bills. That's how we get um, our funding, both financial and technical. Next slide. And then who are we? Uh, we employ a whole bunch of different disciplines, soil scientists, soil conservationists, agronomists, engineers, um, just quite a few different disciplines. And the way you find out um, about our positions is through USA Jobs. So every government agency is required to go through that, um, through that, through that portal. What you do is you can go in and sign up and put in your um, resume and put in your all the details and it will um, send you uh, information whenever um, uh, those positions are opened in your area or if you want to move to California, you want to move to New Hampshire, all of those are in um, USA Jobs. Next slide, please. What our goal is to do uh, working with with people is uh, conservation technical assistance. We want to ensure that um, we, when we're working with producers, um, mainly farmers and ranchers, um, that we get the technical assistance that you need. Next slide. We do it through conservation planning process. Uh, there's nine steps, but three phases, and we collect analysis, uh, we make the decisions and the support and then do the application. Um, sometimes this is not in order. We try to go in order, but sometimes it isn't. Um, and then we try to find out what the issues are when we're working with these producers. What's wrong with the piece of property they have? And we consider those things uh, resource concerns. Next slide, please. 
these are the issues um, that they're having. What are their goals? What is it that they want to do with their property? So we look at these resource concerns and we try to evaluate and figure out how we can help fix the problems. And those are usually through conservation practices. Next slide, please. And conservation practices basically are kind of like a ditch or a pipeline, or if you have a ranch, maybe an, a livestock pipeline, some storage tanks and troughs, um, some interior fences, uh, just depends on what the situation is. But what we want to do is we want to build a conservation plan. We talk to the producers, we figure out, okay, what is it that you, that you need? We'll um, get a, an aerial photo of your farm or your ranch. Um, we can also get the maps of um, what is on your ranch or your farm. And we can, we can show you all of that. Uh, there's even an app for that. You can download um, quite a few apps um, that will uh, web soil survey uh, is amazing. Um, then we would do inventory. We go out and see what is it that is on your property? What is it that um, you have growing? And then what is it that you want to grow? Um, is it, what is it that you're planning for? Is it livestock? Is it wildlife? Uh, we do all of this inventory and then we would um, make recommendations on applying those conservation practices. Uh, we would put a plan together and it would have a time um, when you were going to install it, like, okay, January, February, depending on the, on the practice. And we would give you those job sheets and fact sheets and the technical, um, if we had to do a survey or design, we would give those to you. Those are um, for the producers. Um, that's with the technical assistance that we offer. They can do whatever they want to with that. They can go to um, a contractor. They can go to, if, if they know how to do the installation, they can do that. Uh, but that, all of that is technical assistance. Next slide, please. So this is an example of a, a map, and this is a, a piece of property, and it will show, okay, it'll show exactly what is going to be installed when and where and what time. This goes in conjunction with the conservation plan. Next slide, please. This is the plan map. This is the conservation plan. And then it depends if you decide to keep going further. Next slide, please then this is what a contract would look like. A contract would be uh, written if you were going to use any of our right financial assist assistance. Next slide, please. And our financial programs include environmental quality incentives program, which is one of our biggest um, in the state. And it, this is where we can install practices. Uh, concrete ditches, pipelines, troughs, ponds, wildlife habitat, brush management, cover crops. Um, and this is where we could help pay for some of those practices. Next slide, please. And, um, as Javier said earlier, we do not, um, we don't have enough money to contract all of the applications that come into our offices. We wish we could. Um, there's just no way because we, we get an allocation at the beginning of the year and then we divide it up between the different um, forest, range, and cropland. And then we also have incentives, I'm sorry, uh, uh, initiatives, local state initiatives, and then we have national initiatives. The local initiatives have to come from the general allocation that we get from national headquarters. And then some of the national initiatives, um, there's special monies that come with those initiatives. Next slide, please. The Conservation Stewardship Program, that's another big program we have in the state. And this is if somebody is doing a good um, job on doing conservation on their, on their property, but they would like to continue doing better or, or improve the conservation, this would be an excellent opportunity. Um, these ones are enhancements. Um, uh, enhancements can be part of a conservation practice, but it's enhancing whatever the practice is. Next slide, please. 
Now we have the easement program, and this is, say for instance, you have a piece of property, your ranch has been in your family for four, five, six generations, and you would like to continue keeping it into in agriculture, this would be a perfect opportunity to put it into an easement. Basically, what it would do is um, the government would purchase the development rights, but in some cases, this may be a way to, for somebody to be able to keep their, their ranch. Uh, next slide, please. We have conservation innovation grants. This is if somebody is doing something innovative with the conservation practice or they want to do some field trials on cover crops, this is a perfect opportunity. There is the state um, allocation, which is $75,000 per project. And then there is also a national um, program that you can apply. Um, that one can go up into the millions of dollars. So it just depends on how big your project is. Next slide, please. We have the Regional Conservation Partnership Program. It's one of the biggest ones we have in the state. This one is where our partners can write a program uh, or write a, a, uh, an agreement and then we can work with them and they can help us with technical assistance and it also comes with financial assistance. So say for instance we have a partner that wants to come help us and they can they have cultural resource specialists or they have somebody uh, if we have to do a lot of NEPA work um, this would be a perfect opportunity. Um, it is a one-to-one -one match, so if they come to the table, they have to have the match they are requesting. But remember that it could also be in-kind, and we consider that a leverage. So um, if they want to do something, they, you know, they can do it as an in-kind piece. Next slide, please. How do you use these programs? You contact your local um, NRCS office. We have an office in every county except for Los Alamos. Um, but that is serviced out of the Hernandez office. Um, and we use, all you have to say is, hey, I would like to uh, build a conservation plan. I need some assistance. And then, um, then they'll explain the conservation plan and then they can help you um, if you are looking at um, implementing or applying for any of our uh, financial assistance programs. Um, they'll still steer you in the right direction and say, okay, this is what this program does, this program, this program, and, and then you can make those decisions. Next slide, please. So there are five steps to assistance. We do the conservation planning, as I was talking about, the application process, eligibility, and then a ranking period. We would, um, you would, we rank to see how high um, you rank in that process, and then you implement the program. If we would give you the um, the design, if there's um, any kind of design work that needs to be done, and if you can, um, you have you're handy with the um, with the backhoe, and you can lay your own pipe, or you know, just depending on the situation, you can do that. It just has to meet standards and specifications. Our field offices also have a list of contractors and we'll give you that list. And we don't say this one's better than this one or that one, don't use that one. It's just a list and you know you, you need to go out and do your homework. Then whenever the practice is implemented and installed, we'll go out and do a checkout. And if you meet uh, the standards and specifications, then you get the payment. Next slide. This is our administrative areas for New Mexico. Um, the little dots indicate a field office and then we're um, uh, broken into teams. We have 11 teams in the state. We have two areas, the north area and the south area. Next slide, please. Eligibility, uh, you need to be a person, a legal entity, an Indian tribe, native corporation, a joint operation. Just depends on, on um, how you're, um, you're organized. Be engaged in the ag production or have control of a non-industrial private forest land. Um, you need to go to a farm service agency and establish a farm uh, record. Um, you'll have to uh, bring in either deeds or leases. 
Um, you don't have to own the piece of property. You just have to have control of the land at um, application and then when you're going to receive a payment. Um, next slide, please. Um, these are the top eight practices that we uh, have in New Mexico. It changes from year to year, but these are the ones that we, we do quite a bit of. Um, brush management, conservation crop rotation, the pipelines, sprinklers, fans, livestock pipeline, watering facilities, which is basically a trough or a storage tank, and then forest stand improvement, which is basically thinning. Now, how do you get involved with your local office? You can call the office and find out um, what the conservation, which conservation district is there. And then if you wanna get involved, they're always looking for members to be board members and advisors. So this is a perfect opportunity for you to um, give some input to our programs and our priorities. Um, the, each um, district belongs to a local work group and then the local work group meets between one and two times a year and they help determine um, the, if they want to do the ranking, uh, if they want to help with the resource concerns and what is it that, that's the, affecting that issue uh, that year. Um, they can go ahead and, and become part of the conservation district as well as the, um, the, local, uh, the local work group. But that's a perfect opportunity. Um, so remember the soil and water conservation districts and the local work groups. Um, and then I think that if anybody has any questions, um, you can call me or you can send me an email um, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all of you. Thank, to, thank you to everyone for um, their presentation. We will now have a five minute break, uh, five minute break uh, before we come back um, for our next presentation on water issues and rights. <laughs> 